All right, the next part of this section is to look at the Compton effect. So in the last little bit, we've started to talk about how Einstein and Planck had advanced more of the particle model or the photon model of light. And it gave some pretty solid evidence that couldn't exactly be ignored. And of course, this caused a lot of tension in the 20th century because we had spent so much time developing the wave model and it had great explanations for observed phenomena. So it was kind of thought, well, if the wave model explains things pretty well, why, how is the particle model going to work? So the last, and what most people argue, is the last real great piece of evidence for the particle model to compete with the wave model is this idea of the Compton effect. So basically what Compton was looking at is he was looking at electrons and he was looking at x-ray scattering. So basically what was going to happen here is you'd have an incoming x-ray photon and you'd have an electron at rest. Now they would interact and then this electron would move off in some direction, it would be recoiled, and then the x-ray photon would scatter. What Compton had noticed though is that there was a slight change in the wavelength. So this scattered photon had a slightly larger wavelength than the instant photon. Now, we also, again, recall that energy is proportional to 1 over wavelength. So if this scattered photon has an increase in wavelength, it means that it has a slight decrease in energy. Well, we know from conservation of energy that that energy would have went into the electron at rest to cause it to start moving. So this whole application of looking at photons and scattering this is basically what we call the Compton effect. So we're going to have a photon coming in. Usually, classically, it's an X-ray. It's going to hit an e electron. That electron is going to recoil, and that photon is going to scatter with a larger wavelength. Now, when we do analysis of these type of collisions, people start to get scared when they see photons and all that. This is just a glancing collision from the momentum unit. The only thing that's going to change is instead of using P equals MV for the photon, we're going to use P equals H over lambda, and that's something we'll talk about later. We haven't got quite got to that yet. But the big result from this is it showed that photons themselves have momentum. Because when that photon interacts with this electron and causes it to recoil, and then the photon scatters, like I said, we're looking at this from a perspective of momentum. So this is showing that these photons have momentum, and momentum is something we associate with particles. So Compton effect was kind of the last real nice big piece of evidence to support that light can also behave like a particle. Now, with Compton effect, it can be analyzed using conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and a lot of fancy mathematics. We are not responsible for doing the fancy mathematics in high school. It's a little bit beyond our scale. But that change in wavelength observed in Compton scattering, that change in wavelength is going to be the Planck's constant divided by the mass of the electron times the speed of light. And then all that is going to be 1 minus cosine theta. So change in wavelength, Planck's constant. The Planck's constant, though, this one's a little bit special. It has to be the one that's in joule seconds. We cannot use the one in electron volt seconds. It's not going to work. The mass is always going to be the mass of your electron here. And the other thing is the angle. The angle is the scattering angle of the photon. It's not actually of the electron. That's a whole separate business altogether. This is on the data sheet. This piece isn't, though. What's usually more helpful to remember is that the change in wavelength is the wavelength of the scattered photon minus that wavelength of the incident photon or the incoming photon. This is really helpful to remember on exams. This is what you're given. This is the piece that you have to remember. And like I said, the full derivation is beyond the scope of high school. You don't have to prove that that's the equation for Compton scattering. So let's look at the maximum change in wavelength of a 0.050 nanometer X-ray photon undergoing Compton scattering. All right, let's have a look at the equation for Compton scattering. So the change in wavelength is going to be H over MC1 minus cosine theta. Now, H, M, and C, these are all constants. None of these are going to change, so we don't have any flexibility to change that. All we can really do is we can change this 1 minus cosine. So we want to maximize 1 minus cosine theta. Cosine theta can take values between negative 1 and positive 1. Well, if cosine theta is equal to positive 1, 
we're going to get 1 minus 1. That's going to be equal to 0. We're not going to have a change in wavelength. That's not going to be interesting. But if we let cos theta equal negative 1, that is going to do this 1 minus minus 1, and that's going to give us a 2 here. By letting cosine theta equals negative 1, we are going to maximize this function. Cosine theta is going to equal negative 1 at 180 degrees. So that is what is going on. That is when we're going to have the maximum change in wavelength. To show you what's going on here, here is our electron. So what's happening in this case is we have an incoming photon that's coming in. And then in order to achieve maximum change in wavelength, this it's going to be what we call backscattered. The scattering angle is 180 degrees. Basically what's going to happen is it's going to go back from the direction which it came. So this is a case of backscattering. This will give us the maximum change in wavelength. So let's calculate that maximum change. So the maximum change in wavelength, we know Planck's constant. And again, we've got to use that one in joule seconds. We have the mass of the electron here. And then we have that speed of light. And then, yeah, we want that 1 minus cos 180 because we want this to be 1 minus minus 1. So what are we going to get for our maximum change in wavelength in this scenario? And don't expect a large number. It is going to be quite small. All right. I'm just having some problems typing things into the calculator here. Okay, and then we got that. So we're going to get to the maximum change in wavelength. Now, none of these are using this 0 0.050. So for sig digs, there's not really anything. They're all constant, so the, none of these are helping me for sig digs. So I'll just give it to three sig digs. So we're going to get about 4.85 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So in a Compton scattering, the biggest change in wavelength we can have is 4.85 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. We cannot have anything larger than that. That's the most the wavelength's going to change, so 4.85 picometers. Let's have a look at some other examples with Compton scattering. So we have a stationary electron. It's struck by an X-ray photon. So after the collision, the photon has a scattering angle of 35.4 degrees and a wavelength of 3.25 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. We want to find the initial wavelength of the photon. So before we get to that, let's at least find the change in wavelength. So we know the change of wavelength in a Compton scattering is h over mc, and then 1 minus cosine of the scattering angle of the photon. So we have Planck's constant that we're going to put in here. We're going to divide that by the mass of the electron, and then 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and then 1 minus cos of 35.4 degrees. All right, let's see what we got here. It would have been more convenient if they had to just called this one piece out in front of constant and given us a value for that, but alas, that would have made life a little too easy for us, wouldn't it? All right, let's see what we get here. So we're going to get about 4.485 times 10 to the minus 13 meters. So that is the total change in wavelength between the scattered and the initial wavelengths of the two photon. Or sorry, that is the change in wavelengths between when the photon is scattered versus when the photon is incoming. So we know that the change in wavelength is the scattered wavelength minus the initial. We are interested in this initial wavelength. So the initial wavelength is actually going to be the scattered wavelength minus that change in wavelength that we've determined. So we have our scattered wavelength here. So I'm going to just give myself some space here. So we know our scattered wavelength is 3.25. Sorry about that. 3.25 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. And then we're going to subtract off that change of wavelength that we found for the Compton scattering. So we're going to do minus 12, minus that. So we're going to get about 2. 8, 0 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So what's happening in this scenario is we have an initial photon coming in of 2.80 picometers. It's going to scatter off an electron and then that photon is going to scatter at an angle of 35.4 degrees. After it scatters it's going to have a slight increase in wavelength and it's going to increase to 3.25 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So the last thing 
that we can do to kind of trick and trap people. And this is a real evil, and this is a really dirty trap. So we have an x-ray. It has a frequency of 4.50 times 10 to the 20 hertz, and it's going to undergo Compton scattering. And the frequency of the scattered x-ray is going to be 4.20 times 10 to the 20 hertz. We want to find the scattering angle of the x-ray. So we're still doing Compton scattering. So I have my delta lambda h over mc 1 minus cos theta. Now, at the end of the day, I'd like to get the angle. Now, the angle is that this cos theta is attached to this 1, and this is all multiplying this h over mc. First of all, let's multiply both sides by mc. That way we get rid of this mc stuff here. So I'm going to get mc times the change in wavelength is equal to h 1 minus cos theta. So we have to deal with this multiplication here. We're going to divide both sides by h. So now I'm going to have this mc delta lambda over h. This is equal to 1 minus cos theta. All right, we're making some progress. Let's isolate for cos theta. So I'm going to bring the cos theta to the other side, and I'm going to dump this to the other side. So if I'm real careful with my rearrangement, cos theta is going to look something like this. So I have cosine of theta is equal to 1 minus mc delta lambda over h. So then theta is going to be the inverse cosine of 1 minus mc delta lambda over h. This is pretty bad looking, but it is going to give us the answer. Now, at the end of the day, we know mc and h. Those are all constants. We don't know the change in wavelength. And the problem is we're given frequency. So we also know, and we're going to put this in a separate color. So we know from electromagnetic radiation, c is equal to f lambda. That is something we've known and loved for a long time. So we know that the wavelength is just going to be c over the frequency. What that means is the change in wavelength the scattered minus the initial, that is going to be C over the scattered frequency minus C over the initial frequency. So be really careful. A common thing people want to do is they want to take the difference between these frequencies and then do C over delta F. It doesn't work that way because F is in the denominator. So we have to write this thing out in full. So the actual change in wavelength, so we have this 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then we're told that the scattered frequency is 4.20 times 10 to the 20 hertz. And then we're going to subtract off that 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then we're going to divide that by 4.50 times 10 to the 20 hertz. So a lot of big numbers, a lot of calculations in here. So this is a little bit harder just because of the way we put that frequency. And like, yeah, as I said, you got to be really careful with how you change, change, in, freq change in wavelength when you're involving two frequencies. So like, be really careful with that. Right, by 4.50 E20. So we're going to get something along the lines of about, oh, let's see here, 4.7619 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. So based on the change in frequency I have, this is going to correspond to this particular change in wavelength. Now that we know the change in wavelength, we can now put in our equation for Compton scattering. So the angle is going to be the inverse cosine. And then, yeah, we have a lot to put in here. So we've got this mass of the electron. We have the speed of light. Oh, man, I'm running out of room here. So we've got this 4.7619 times 10 to the minus 14 meters. Then we're going to divide all that by Planck's constant, which is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. All right, a lot there. Now we've got to be really careful when we're doing all these calculations. Take it slow. Don't go too fast. Watch your bracketing. All the stuff, all the advice we'd always give you. All right. So if I'm really, and of course, make sure that your calculator is in degree mode. If it's in radian, that is not going to help. All right, so if I'm really careful with the way I add in all of these numbers, I'm going to get that the scattering angle is about 11.4 degrees. So if you find that you're getting an error, 
like when you do like enter to determine the angle that comes up error it's probably a calculation error something was input incorrectly or something like that so make sure to check your calculator but yeah we're gonna get the scattering angle of about 11.4 degrees so as I mentioned Compton effect it was kind of like that last piece of evidence for people to finally buy it and say oh yeah the particle model actually does have a little bit of validity and like we said and also it describes one of those fundamental phenomena of our universe and it describes the interaction of light or electromagnetic radiation with matter so Compton effect is very important and we're going to do a little bit more with Compton effect later this isn't the end of the story <laughs>